The AJK in Las Vegas show took place on November 14, 1992, at the Union Plaza Hotel. This was only shortly before the rival K1 organization held its first event and became the world's premier kickboxing company, and at the time, the All Japan Kickboxing Federation was still one of the largest forces of international competition. They did a lot of business with the World Kickboxing Association and other major promotions from North America, and this show was a collaboration with Apollo Cook Enterprises, an organization run by kickboxing legend Dale Cook. It's a short event with only five matches, but today, it constitutes an interesting look back in time to when this was still morphing into a truly consolidated worldwide sport. The show is a team-based competition, Team Japan vs. Team USA. All matches are conducted under modified Muay Thai rules. Fighters are allowed low kicks, knees and clinching, but no elbows. The first match is Team Japan's Don Nakaya Nielsen vs. Team America's Jean-Claude Lewan. A somewhat ironic selection of fighters, since Nielsen was a US citizen, and Lewan is listed as being from France. Nielsen had competed professionally since at least 1980, was a longtime holder of the WKA US Cruiserweight Championship, and had achieved fame as a sports star in Japan. Lewan's history is not as well documented, but he may have also competed under the surname Lemieux. Round 1. The boxers come forward and exchange punches and low kicks. Nielsen turns Lewan around with a hard left. Lewan tries to counter with a spinning back fist, but Nielsen capitalizes with an uppercut and a left hook that knocks him down. Lewan is literally falling on his face as he receives the count, but the referee realizes he's in no condition to continue and ends the match. Nielsen wins, less than 30 seconds into the first round. The match is anything but competitive, but nevertheless, this is Don Nielsen, whose goal was always to end a match early with an overwhelming barrage. After being stunned, Lewan made the mistake of not covering up as he turned around, and felt the full force of the champion's strength. Afterwards, Lewan's corner angrily disputes the outcome, saying Nielsen hit him while he was on the floor. But the replay doesn't confirm this. Nielsen started off the event as well as anyone could for Team Japan, and in the process, he demonstrated how much power he possessed, even so late in his career. He'd retire from fighting shortly afterwards to practice alternative medicine, and died in 2017. The next contest is a match in the light heavyweight division between Takeshi Sakazume and Bob Handigan. There isn't much information available on Sakazume, but Handigan is an old hand at martial arts competition. He's a veteran of karate and kickboxing going back at least until the early 80s, and has competed against John Eve Terrio and Marek Piotrowski. At one point, he held the WKA World Super Middleweight Championship. He reportedly accepted this match on short notice, and was fighting at a weight disadvantage. Round 1 begins. Handigan comes in with a bouncing side stance, while Sakazume holds his gloves closer to the Muay Thai style. Handigan gets tied up in the ropes early on, and Sakazume earns boos for his taunting. A spinning back kick from Handigan is returned with two showy spin kicks. Handigan then focuses mainly on punching, while Sakazume almost exclusively throws leg techniques, including a hard knee to the torso that sends Handigan down for the first count. He's back up quickly, but falls again after taking the same knee strike seconds later. Then, again. At round's end, Handigan still seems full of vigor but has gone down three times in short order. Sakazume definitely won this round. Round 2. Handigan gets tied up in the ropes again before throwing a huge spinning backfist and losing his balance. He hits his head on the canvas, and it's one of the few shots he takes above the torso throughout the match. 
Sakazume then almost knocks him out of the ring with a knee strike. Handigan scores with some big overhand strikes, but is thrown down before he can capitalize. Sakazume is penalized for holding while throwing knees to the head, but this makes him add low kicks to his repertoire and makes things all the more difficult for Bob. Handigan finally scores a knockdown of his own with a huge overhand, and Sakazume beats the count just in time for the round to end. Handigan still lost this round, but his knockdown makes up some much-needed ground for him and is probably a big boost to his morale. Round 3 sees Handigan land some more big shots to the head, blasting the water from his opponent's hair, but Sakazume seems braced for them and knocks Handigan down with more knees. He's penalized a second time and goes back to low kicks, promptly knocking Bob's legs out from under him. Handigan keeps trying to score with punches to the head, but Sakazume keeps cutting off his momentum. There's an unintentional low blow, and when Handigan goes down from a kick to the gut a moment later, Sakazume seems afraid that he's going to be penalized again. Round 4. Handigan briefly stabilizes, managing to control the distance with sidekicks, but Sakazume uses Bob's own side stance against him by kicking his legs out. For all of the knockdowns he's endured, Handigan doesn't seem particularly hurt, but he's very frustrated, losing his temper after the umpteenth fall. Sakazume lands another knee, and it's clear that Handigan's midsection has become a tender target. Handigan goes for a jump spinning back kick, but is kicked out of the air. It seems as though Bob is going through his entire repertoire of moves, trying to find something, anything, that could counter his opponent. As the fifth and final round begins, Handigan likely knows that his chances are slim. Sakazume has stifled him at every turn, and he's hopelessly trailing in points. He's not given up, but finishing the match with dignity must seem like the more reasonable goal. When Handigan goes down following the rare punch from Sakazume, you can see that his frustration has been replaced with sheer exhaustion. Sakazume may have landed an inadvertent rabbit punch as the round nears its end, but even though the ref doesn't notice it, Handigan is at least able to finish the fight on his feet. Finally, the match is over. The fighters congratulate each other, and Takeshi Sakazume is declared the winner by unanimous decision. It comes as no surprise. Sakazume doesn't seem like a particularly seasoned fighter. He makes a few mistakes with the rules, needs to be told multiple times to go to the neutral corner, and even gets angry with the crowd. But his technique gives him a major advantage over Handigan, who simply doesn't know how to deal with knees, low kicks and clinch fighting. That said, Handigan showed how tough he was by going the distance, and Sakazume was clearly wary of his power. After suffering his single knockdown, Takeshi did all he could so as to avoid dealing with Bob's fists and was very quick to limit Handigan's momentum. Nevertheless, Bob made a general mistake by keeping it too simple for his opponent. He threw too many single techniques and let Sakazume control the distance too often. Sakazume had more techniques for fighting at various ranges, but Handigan could have used his own kicks to lower his opponent's guard before coming in with punches. Again, this was not a very competitive fight, but not for a lack of effort. If nothing else, it is an interesting study of style versus style. The third match is Naoko Kumagai versus Lisa Smith for the WKA World Women's Flyweight Championship. Smith, the champion, is a protege of the great Kathy Long, who's standing in her corner. Kumagai may be most recognizable from her appearance in Jackass the movie, but currently, she was in the process of becoming one of Japan's very best fighters and premier knockout artist. At a time when Japan was producing some of the best stars of international competition, Naoko was contending for the top of the heap. Round 1 commences. Smith suffers an early knockdown, but otherwise makes a good initial impression. She's aggressive and fights with combinations, effectively putting her opponent on the defensive. At the same time, Kumagai looks solid as a rock, 
Even when just moving forward, she very smoothly and decisively shifts her weight to maintain strong balance, and her defense is very tight. As the fight goes on, referee Cecil Peoples seems to imply that Kumagai can only throw one knee in the clinch, which is different from all other fights of the night. Both are fighting more continually than anything seen in the previous match, and it's a welcome change of pace. The round ends with neither looking the worse for wear, but the knockdown wins it for now Ko. Round 2 has Kumagai scoring what looks like another decisive knockdown, but the referee calls it a slip. Smith is still fighting very aggressively, not getting worn down in the clinch and throwing a lot of leather. Kumagai is also using her boxing to good effect, not relying much on kicks. Things grow more intense when Smith catches her in an awkward hold, and while Kumagai is waiting for them to be separated, Smith strikes her on the side of the head. Smith may not have been attempting an illegal punch, but Kumagai might have assumed otherwise. In return, she lands a straight right to the side of Smith's jaw, and while Lisa remains upright, she no longer seems as prepared to come forward. Round 3. Both fighters have regained their fire, getting into some intense clinches that Peoples quickly breaks up. Kumagai is throwing more kicks, but Smith matches her well and throws a greater variety. It's a fairly even round. Round 4. Now in the second half of the match, the pressure is beginning to build for the fighters. Kumagai is still coming forward but seems to be landing some of her best hits as counter strikes. She sinks a knee that hurts Smith enough to slow her down, again making her less eager to engage. Smith absorbs more counter punches and tries to keep Kumagai off her with kicks for the rest of the round. This round goes to Kumagai, who's considerably more aggressive and lands more strikes. Fifth and final round. Both boxers are still fighting with a relatively high level of energy. Smith takes another big knee and afterwards protects her abdomen whenever it seems as though Kumagai is angling for another one. She lands a hard shot to the head, but by now may no longer have the power to do real damage to Kumagai. Now Ko continues to focus on Lisa's midsection, landing kicks whenever a knee isn't possible. In the closing seconds, Smith throws a big spinning back fist, but it doesn't land. Moments later, the match is over. The back-and-forth action of this bout is a major change from the earlier fights. Lisa Smith put forth an effort the rest of her team can aspire towards, while now Ko Kumagai was an exemplar of power and tactic. The decision from the judges arrives and now Ko Kumagai is unanimously named the winner, becoming the new world champion. Smith doesn't look like she agrees with the outcome, but it's difficult to imagine the verdict going any other way. Smith made a great effort, landed some good shots and demonstrated stamina, but Kumagai was ultimately the one who landed the harder hits, put her opponent in greater trouble, and imposed her will, more thoroughly. Add to this the first round knockdown, and it can only be her match. The fourth match is a featherweight contest between Kensaku Maeda and Billy Bowen. Bowen fights out of Tulsa, weighs 128 pounds and boasts a record of 14 and 4 with 7 KOs. Maeda fights out of Tokyo and weighs 126.5 pounds. He has a perfect record of 13 and 0 with 6 KOs and is currently the All Japan Featherweight Champion. Like Naoko Kumagai, he was, or soon would be, one of Japan's most renowned in his division. He fought until the early days of the K1 Max division, and since then has become a renowned kickboxing trainer. The first round begins. Maeda promptly intercepts Bowen's charge, laying him down on the ring floor. This is the gentlest exchange we'll see during the fight. Bowen manages to land some wild punches, but Maeda catches him in the clinch, holding on as Bowen tries to power out. Afterwards, Bowen charges in, only to be caught again. It feels like intentional intimidation, with Maeda holding Bowen without striking while the other tries to squirm free. 
It happens again, with Bowen failing to throw effective knees. He later throws an awkward low kick, after which Maeda scores a knockdown with a low kick of his own. It looks more like a sweep, but the referee counts it. These weren't the hardest hitting three minutes of the night, but it was still an authoritative display from Maeda. Round 2. The fighters exchange kicks, and it doesn't favor Bowen. He drives Maeda back, only to get stopped again with the clinch, this time almost being pushed through the ropes. Bowen still isn't handling these lockups well. He attempts to pull free as soon as he's grabbed, not at all comfortable fighting at this distance, but Maeda's so strong that he can just hold on, like a cowboy bulldogging a calf. Bowen manages his best offense during this round, including a strong punch to the head, but Maeda cuts him off by grabbing him about the neck again, and lays in with his knees. Bowen blocks them, but Maeda seems confident that he's still hurting his opponent. Round 3. Maeda throws a jumping kick, and Bowen looks desperate as he tries to avoid even more knees. There's a moment where Maeda holds Bowen off with a glove in his face, like a schoolyard bully. Bowen is then clinched with his arms up, and Maeda zaps him with a painful-looking knee to the ribs. Maeda then catches him in the head with his thigh, followed by another couple knees to the torso that finally lead to arguably the first genuine knockdown of the fight. We finally see the toll that this match has taken on Bowen, who looks to be in a great deal of pain. Round 4. Bowen throws some awkward kicks before being pushed down. He's raising his leg preemptively, a sure sign that he's intimidated by Maeda's kicks. When the referee steps between the fighters to warn Maeda about low blows, Bowen puts his hands on his knees in blatant display of exhaustion. By now, Maeda's simply measuring him for kicks, and the one which ends the fight is a right mid-kick. There's no good camera angle of its impact, but it probably catches Bowen in the ribs. He goes down, and it's clear that he can't continue. Mercifully, this match is over, Maeda winning by knockout. There's no comparing the technique of the fighters. Maeda is strong and crisp, while Bowen eventually threw little more than wobbly kicks and pawing punches. Unlike Bob Handigan, Bowen took some genuine, doctor-necessitating punishment, and didn't know how to deal with it. In the end, the American crowd is behind Maeda. There weren't any outrageous fouls or taunting, and Las Vegas likely grew to respect his skill, cheering him while Bowen lay on the canvas. The main event is a contest for the WKA World Featherweight Muay Thai Championship, between Takahiro Shimitsu and Ray Fernandez. Fernandez, fighting out of Phoenix, weighs 127 pounds and arrives with a 15-3 record. He's also the ISKA World Lightweight Champion, and the first kickboxing world champion from Arizona. Shimitsu, the current WKA champion, weighs 124.5 pounds and has a record of 27, 3 and 1. On paper, this is one of the more even matches. Shimitsu is more experienced, but both competitors are world champs, and Fernandez actually has experience in fighting under this rule set. Round 1. Shimitsu and Fernandez exchange early punches and kicks, and during this time, Fernandez is knocked off balance and slips hard. The strikes become more forceful, culminating in a partially blocked mid-kick that surprisingly sits Fernandez down in the corner. Seconds later, Shimitsu knocks Fernandez down again with a kick that doesn't even fully connect, and moments later, he does it again with a more decisive kick to the upper thigh. Fernandez almost doesn't meet the 10 count. It keeps happening, to the point that the referee is blatantly giving Fernandez time to recover when he doesn't get up immediately. Round 1 ends with Fernandez having suffered four knockdowns within three minutes. Fernandez is clearly struggling, but it's not clear why. It's possible that he injured his hip or his ribs during the earlier slip, or that he aggravated an existing injury. Whatever the case, 
This is a terrible way for the challenger to start off his match against a fighter like Takahiro Shimitsu. Round 2. Fernandez is aware that he needs to win back some ground, but a low kick sends him down in the corner before he can get started. He's obviously frustrated, and again almost doesn't make the count. Fernandez then throws everything he can, front kick, spinning back kick, right overhand, but a low kick earns Shimitsu yet another knockdown. Again, it keeps happening. There's one moment of hope. Shimitsu throws a low kick just as Fernandez throws a right overhand, they both connect, and both go down. While it's likely that Shimitsu merely lost his balance, Peoples gives both fighters the count. Fernandez manages to land a few more head shots, and the crowd is behind him, but he's already so spent of energy that he falls down during a kick attempt and halts his own momentum. When he's knocked down yet again, there's a clear view of the bruises on his arm and ribs. He goes down one more time from a low kick, and this time, he can't meet the count. Takahiro Shimitsu wins via knockout. This match made the event a clean sweep for Team Japan, and truly emphasizes both the tactical supremacy and great fortune with which they entered this contest. Fernandez has had much better bouts than this, but his shocking lack of competitiveness here suggests, at best, some unfortunate circumstance that adversely affected his competency. This is not to say that Takahiro Shimitsu couldn't or wouldn't have won even if Fernandez were 100%, but the apparent ease with which Fernandez was repeatedly beaten to a knockdown is at odds with the expectations for someone experienced in Muay Thai. More than anything, All Japan Kickboxing in Las Vegas acted as a warning to the U.S. kickboxing establishment, reminding American fighters why it was important to keep up with modern rules to remain competitive. The Handigan and Bowen matches in particular showed how imperative it is to know how to use and deal with low kicks and clinch fighting. From a competitive standpoint, it's not terribly exciting, although the Smith-Kumagai bout is the event's saving grace and worth a watch for anyone. Fans of kickboxing from this period will probably enjoy the show, but it's not a must-see event unless you're already invested in these fighters. It's a personal favorite, and if nothing else, it's entertaining for the one-sidedness of the outcome.